Okay, so shall we start? Oh. Uh, so uh, welcome to the World Lecture 3. I think this will be uh, this is uh, practically the last uh, uh, plenary lecture except for the closing ceremony of the Congress. So the speaker is uh, Martin Powell uh, from UBC. He'll be talking about the uh, higher dimensional spaces. So Martin, please. Okay, thank you, Takeshi. So um, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about random walks on some higher dimensional spaces, deterministic and random. And um, these spaces are harder to handle than the low dimensional spaces that I talked about in the previous lecture. And the basic reason for the higher dimensional ones being harder is that in low dimensional spaces, the elliptic Harnack inequality is easy to prove. We saw in the previous lecture that in particular in the strongly recurrent case, um, if you have a point to point resistance estimate plus good control on sizes of balls, then you get out the elliptic Harnack inequality. Um, in the higher dimensional case, the elliptic Harnack inequality, there's no simple proof of it. And so the Gregorian Telch theorem, which was very useful um, in lecture two, um, it has three ingredients, a resistance bound, a volume ground, and the elliptic Harnack inequality. The resistance and volume bound may be reasonably accessible, but the elliptic Harnack inequality may be very hard to prove um, because it requires a lot of control of um, harmonic functions. So in this talk, I'm going to look at three um, basic families of um, examples. First of all, I'm going to look at the supercritical percolation cluster in ZD. That's not a fractal um, uh, set, um, but, but we'll, it's still a, we're going to be looking at random walks on this random graph. Then we're going to look at regular fractals with DF bigger than or equal to DW. So marginally recurrent or transient. And we're going to finally, I'm going to say a little bit about the random walk on the uniform infinite planar triangulation. So let's start with the supercritical percolation for D bigger than or equal to two. And recall from the first lecture, the um, bond percolation model that we met. So when we're in the supercritical case, P bigger than PC, um, it took a while to prove, but with probability one, there is a unique infinite cluster, which I'll denote C infinity. And we wish to study the simple random walk on C infinity. So what does C infinity look like? Well, um, many years ago, Harry Keston said, um, it's like a net, but in higher dimensions, we should really think about a thick sort of D-dimensional net, objects which we don't actually normally meet much in um, our everyday lives. Um, the following theorem, um, mainly due to Antal and Pastora, helps to sort of make a bit more precise what's going on. So let's take a large Q, Q in ZD. Then, except on a set of um, sort of stretched exponentially small probability, we have the following three statements holding. We look at the intersection of Q with the infinite cluster C infinity. And it consists of one large cluster C star Q and some small clusters. All the small clusters are of diameter less than log r to the c, and in fact, therefore, going to be close to the boundary. And the big cluster c star q intersects every face of q and is sort of big in q in the sense that if you have any little cube of side r to the delta, then c star q intersect, will intersect that cube too. And I should have added a fourth thing, which is that there are no, um, all the percolation clusters, not just Q intersects infinity, but um, uh, all the open clusters inside um, uh, Q, apart from C infinity are a diameter less than log R to the C. So basically what you've got is one big spanning cluster inside the box and uh, lots of little bits. So we're going to look at random walk on C infinity. Um, as in the previous lectures, we're going to write PX omega for the law of the random walk on the random graph C infinity of omega. Um, 
The basic question, of course, is what is the large scale behavior of the random walk X? So theorem AP tells us that at large scales, C infinity is in some sense close to RD. And so it's very reasonable to guess that we will have an invariance principle of functional central limit theorem. So that if we take the random walk, we rescale it in the usual diffusive fashion, then the rescaled random walks are going to converge in an appropriate sense to um, some multiple of Brownian motion. And we can also ask about the heat kernel transition density of the process X. In other words, um, the transition density where we normalize the probabilities by the degree of the point X. So here is a guide to how we might um, proceed. And this is the theorem of Thierry Delmotte in 1999. Um, and I've simplified it a bit. So let's look at a weighted graph which satisfies V alpha and local regularity, same local regularity conditions as in previous lectures. Then one has three equivalent conditions. Gaussian heat kernel bounds hold, in other words, that's HK alpha two. The, um, that should be a G, sorry. The, the graph G satisfies the a Poincare inequality, and I'll explain what that is in a few moments. And the third condition is a parabolic Harnack inequality holds. So I'm not going to tell you about parabolic Harnack inequalities, but um, it's useful to keep in mind that the PHI gives you continuity and regularity of the heat kernel, and it implies the elliptic Harnack inequality. So this is a graph theorem of um, a characterization of the parabolic Harnack inequality given by Gregorian and Salofkost in the early 1990s, done first in the context of manifolds. And the methods both of Gregorian, um, well, of, of Salofkost and of Delmott um, used um, the PD methods of Moser. Gregorian actually used other PD methods developed in the Russian school. So this theorem gives us a guide as to how we may be able to prove um, Gaussian transition density bounds if we can prove that the graph satisfies the Poincaré inequality and the condition V alpha. So let's now see what the Poincaré inequality is. And this is the statement of the Poincaré inequality. In fact, it's a family of inequalities which should be holding for every ball and for all functions on, from the ball, real valued functions from the ball. So it takes a moment, perhaps if you haven't met these before, to digest the content of this inequality. On the left-hand side, we've got essentially the variance of the function f over the ball. f bar b is the mean of the, um, is the real number which minimizes the left-hand side, which of course is the mean of f on this, on this ball. On the right-hand side, we've got a constant, we've got the radius of the ball squared, and we've got the energy of the function f in the ball. In other words, the, yeah, this thing, which if F were an electrical potential would, would be the energy dissipation um, of, due to that function. And to see what the Poincaré inequality is, say, is saying, it's useful to um, look at examples where it fails. And the basic example of a graph for which it fails is if we take two copies of ZD, um, and then we just put one edge between the, um, the origins um, in, of, of those two copies. So we've got two big um, graphs with one little edge connecting the two. And it's easy to see the Poincaré inequality fails when D is bigger than or equal to three. Let's O be the origin in one of the graphs and consider that the ball of center zero and radius R. And let's look at the function, which is one on one copy of ZD and minus one on the other then basically the left-hand side, F bar is almost zero. So the left-hand side is about the size of the ball, which is R to the D. The only edge on which F is not, con is, is, is not constant is the edge connecting the two um, copies of ZD. So the right hand, this expression here is one, we're looking at natural weights. And so the right-hand side of this is R squared. And obviously, um, when D is bigger than or equal to three, this, that shows that the inequality follows. <laughs>
It also fails when d equals two, but you have to work a bit harder to find the example. And probabilistically, what the Poincaré is inequality is doing is it's forcing the graph to be sort of well connected from the point of view of the random walk. Um, there are no sort of bottlenecks um, in, in, in the graph which are sort of visible to the random walk. So um, looking at Poincaré inequality, it may not be clear at all how one goes about proving it, but there are fairly straightforward methods that give us the Poincaré inequality from an isoparametric inequality. Um, so supposing that we're in the following situation, um, for all balls B and su subsets A of B with measure um, half less than or equal to half B, we have the following isoparametric type inequality. So if we look at the quantity here, we're summing the edge weights over points in Y, sorry, points X in A and points Y in B minus A. So in a sense, we're looking at the mass of this purple line here um, between the two sets. And we're saying that the boundary between these two sets is bigger than mu W of A divided by R. So if you have an isoparametric inequality of this kind, um, and I think you should be able to convince yourself quite easily um, that it holds, it should hold in, for example, ZD, then the um, Poincaré inequality holds. So with this theorem in mind, um, we can now turn to um, supercritical percolation. And the first problem that we encounter is that the PD methods, proof methods, assume that the space satisfies the volume estimates and the Poincaré inequality for all balls. Um, but for percolation, it's very clear that any allowable local configuration can occur with positive probability. And so you cannot possibly expect these properties to hold for all balls. So if we look far enough in C infinity, we would be able to find arbitrarily large bad regions. So we fix a particular bad region that we want to look at. Looking far enough, we're going to find um, uh, some little um, region like that. And if, for example, you look at a point at the end of the tail of the Z like this, then clearly the volume of this ball um, looking in the graph metric is going to grow linearly, not um, quadratically. So there are going to be bad regions um, in, in the graph, and we can't possibly expect Poincaré inequality or um, uh, V2 or VD to hold in this context. But in a certain sense, big bad regions are a long way away. And we can do a sort of back of envelope calculation um, to um, sort of get an, an idea of how far away or how big the bad regions are. So supposing we're looking for a specific bad configuration like the one we saw on the previous slide, which has volume V. The probability of seeing that in a particular region is e to the minus CV. And so very roughly to find it in the ball of radius R, we need R to the D times e to the minus CV to be about one or the volume to be a roughly order about log R. So one expects the biggest bad region in B zero R to be a volume about log R and radius log R to the one over D. Of course, there's a question here, which I'm going over, which is, I was talking first of all about one specific type of bad region and then um, any bad region. So how many different kinds of bad regions are there? Um, so that's why these, this is only very sort of hand-waving and heuristic. But if we accept this, that the bad regions in a ball of radius R should be of order, radius order log R to the one over D. The question then is, do, do these log fluctuations in the percolation cluster cause log corrections in the Gaussian bounds? And at the sort of crudest level, the answer is no. 
And the reason for that is that the time to region a, leave a bad region like the foot of the Z that we saw in the previous slide is a, about the square of the diameter of the region. So about log R to the two over D. And on the other hand, if we're looking at the random walk in a ball of radius R, the time to leave the, that should be about R squared. And this is so much smaller than this, that basically, if you think about any little bad region, heat has plenty of time to homogenize in that bad region um, uh, but, um, over the time scales that we're looking at. So the difficulties due to bad regions can be overcome. And here is a very quick sketch of what one can um, do. First of all, for a cube of size R, with um, high probability, one has the isoperimetric inequality of the right kind for C star Q. And also the size of C star Q is going to be um, bounded by and blow by constants times R to the D. So most large cubes satisfy VD and the Poincaré inequality. And using that, one can then adapt the methods of Nash, um, who worked on the same kind of PD problem as um, Moser at about the same time, or the methods of Moser, um, so that they work in this situation. And loosely, one gets a result which says that if um, balls have size R to the D and the Poincaré inequality, and they hold these hold for large enough balls, then the heat kernel PNXY is going to satisfy Gaussian bounds for large enough times um, n. And in this paper here, um, we made some more precision on what one means by, can mean by large enough. So here are the Gaussian bounds that one get, has for the supercritical percolation cluster. There exist random variables Sx of omega um, with stretched exponential tails. And there are non-random constants Ci, depending on DMP, such that we have these Gaussian type upper and lower bounds for the transition density. We have dis different constants C2 and C uh, in the exponentials and of course in the outside the exponentials as, as well. And these bounds don't hold for all X and Y. They only hold when the time N is first of all, bigger than a constant times X minus Y. Remember that um, because we're looking at the discrete time random walk, there's no possibility of it moving a distance um, R in time less than R. But we also require that N should be bigger than this random variable C SX of omega. And it's the random variables SX of omega which take care of the randomness of the environment. If you're in a sort of good or typical point, um, SX is going to be small. If you're in um, your point X is in a bad region, then SX of omega is going to be um, basically the size of the square of the diameter of the bad region. And if you were actually going to use these um, bounds to sort of do some calculations, um, you, you, you need um, good control on the tails of the random variables, Sx. And this theorem implies that in the terminology that we met um, earlier in these lectures, the walk dimension of C infinity is two and the spectral dimension of C infinity is D and the fractal dimension of it is also D. So this theorem answers the first of our two questions that we had on um, long range, behavior of random walk on percolation clusters, we do have the Gaussian transition, transition density bounds. So the second question is, what about a functional central limit theorem? So in this case, we want to set things up um, uh, accurately. So recall we have two types of randomness, configuration randomness and randomness for the random walk. And we use PP for the um, random, randomness probability on the configurations and PX omega for the random walk probability. So let's set things up for um, a central limit theorem. Let F be a continuous functional on um, the space of paths and the W be Brownian motion. 
let x n t be n to the minus a half times the um, continuous piecewise continuous version of the simple random walk x with the usual diffusive, diffusive type um, rescaling. Then there are essentially two different types of functional central limit theorem. Um, a quenched FCLT, which says that on the event when zero is in the infinite cluster, for each, <clears throat> almost surely, one has that the um, these functions converge to the corresponding function of um, Brownian motion. So that's basically saying that almost surely, um, so you choose your omega, and unless you make um, you're unlucky and choose an omega in a set of probability zero, on that random graph, you're going to have the rescaled um, uh, result, which gives you the um, central functional central limit theorem. And the second kind, weaker, is the averaged or annealed FCLT, which says that if we look at the average of these quantities, then um, we get that um, convergence. So probabilists, um, here I'm using the word averaged. Probabilists often use the term annealed for this kind of result, but um, Chuck Newman um, told me that in fact, the, in the physics literature, when they use annealed, they have a slightly different sense. So even though it would require breaking um, many decades of habits, it would really be better if we call these averaged results rather than annealed results. But um, I'm breaking my rule in the very next um, slide by calling it an annealed CLT. So an annealed or average CLT was proved in this context by Kipnis, Verad, and, and Damasi and others. And they used um, a, an idea which at first sight seems absolutely um, crazy, which is you look at the environment viewed from the particle. So you, you imagine yourself sitting on the random walk, you see around yourself the environment, so what you've got is an absolutely immense space, which is the space of all possible um, environments um, going out from, from the particle. But this is a compact space, and therefore some things work for it rather nicely, which don't work for the original random walk. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but the, the same circle of ideas that um, Kipnis and Veridan and so forth used to get the annealed CLT give um, the construction of what Kozlov called a corrector. So this is a random function on ZD, which is small on average. And so let's look at the function. So the basic idea is going to be for each point X in C infinity, we're going to move it a small amount um, chi of X. And now if we look at x plus the amount that we move it, we get function phi x, and that gives us an embedding of the, um, of, of the points in C infinity in Rd. And the point of this um, uh, embedding is that the graph should be harmonic, so that each vertex of phi x is at the barycenter of its neighbors. What that means is that the if we look at phi of the random walk xn, we have a martingale. So we can rescale things and we can write xnt, the rescaled martingale minus um, the, re the rescaling of the um, uh, corrector applied to the process x. And this rescaled martingale um, is ergodic. We have control over its um, uh, increments. And so a martingale CLT gives fairly easily that the rescale processes MN converge to a multiple of Brownian motion. So to handle the process XN, this term is good. We just need to know that the second term converges to zero. So to, to prove the quenched functional central limit theorem, it remains to prove that the, um, uh, the rescaled process corrector and converges to zero. Now, I didn't go into details at all, but the construction of the corrector gives that it, it's small on average. And the Gaussian bounds then basically tell us that this, ran, this random variable is sort of nicely spread out. 
And so in fact, that the, this quantity here converges to zero, um, P zero omega, almost surely. And so we have the following theorem proved in the period 2004 to 2007 by, um, in different cases, by a number of different um, groups. And for a set of omega, we have the quenched functional central limit theorem. So for a set of omega, which has probability one, a functional central limit theorem holds for X. And I should mention that um, one doesn't need the full strength of the Gaussian bound. We just need the Gaussian upper bound in order to smooth out the distribution of the process X. Before I go on to look at fractals, I should just say a few words about an obvious extension of the um, percolation. So percolation is just ZD with IID Bernoulli um, random edge weights. And a natural extension is the random conductance model. So we're going to look at ZD with stationary ergodic random weights, WXY. Now, one difference from the percolation case is that if the law of W has full support in zero infinity, then that means that W can be very close to zero or very large. And so the quantity, if we fix an edge XY, WXY divided by the weight of Ws coming out of a vertex X, this quantity um, may be very small. And so the local regularity that we saw earlier and was a hypothesis in several of our theorem fails in the case of the random conductance model. So some of the connections which occur between transition densities, Harnack inequalities and so forth break down um, in this case. One doesn't actually get such nice transition density estimates. And one way of dealing with this problem is to do a little local surgery on the, on the space to sort of cut out the bits with um, uh, WXY, um, either too big or too small. Let me quickly mention some highlights of the work um, on the random conductance model. If the edge weights are IID and the probability that um, WE is positive is strictly bigger than PC, then we have um, a quenched functional central limit theorem. We also have a quenched functional central limit theorem if the omega E's, w, sorry, WE's are ergodic um, under certain moment conditions on WE and the WE to the minus one. And that was the work of Andres Deutschel and Snovic using Moser type methods. And then in the IID case, there's been a lot of progress on getting very good results on the information of how quickly the convergence takes place. And um, this is due to Gloria Otto, Murat and, and others in the period 2011 on. So now I'm going to turn away from um, the random conductance model and talk about um, higher dimensional fractal graphs. And I'm going to start with the case of regular deterministic graphs, such as those based on the higher dimensional Sierpinski carpets. So this is um, uh, a fractal which Mandelbrot called the Menga sponge. And I think you can see from the picture fairly well how it um, is constructed. If you think about the Sierpinski carpet in three dimensions, you've got a big hole in the middle, but the outside of it is just looks like the outside of a cube. So I didn't show you that. And let's remember the heat kernel bounds, HK alpha beta, that we met in the previous lectures. Um, Pn xy plus Pn plus one xy bounded above and below by constants with different Cs, n to the minus alpha over beta, and then this sub Gaussian type term here. And that it's also remind you that beta is always bigger than or equal to two, and that when beta is equal to two, we get Gaussian bounds. And now in these lectures, we've seen two ways of proving, two possible ways of proving these bounds. First, we have the theorem of Gregorian and Telch, which says that if we have a volume estimate, an estimate on the resistance of annuli and the elliptic Harnack inequality, that's equivalent to HK alpha and beta. And then we saw 
theorem D, which was very useful for the percolation um, case and for uh, the beta equals two case, which says that the volume bound plus the Poincare inequality is equivalent to HK alpha two. Both these are under assuming local regularity, of course. And what, we, what would we like to be able to do for higher dimensions? Well, we'd like stability of these bounds under bounded perturbation of weights. We'd like to characterize these bounds in terms of conditions which can be verified in practice. And we'd like methods which have worked for random graphs. And as you will see, we have made progress on some of these um, problems, but um, the story is not as complete as one would like it to be, and is not as complete as it is in the low dimensional case. The first step is to look at a more general Poincare inequality. Um, so this is the standard Poincare inequality um, that we saw earlier. Let's use the notation 2b to denote twice the, the ball of um, radius um, 2r, where b is the ball of radius r. And let's write e to b f f for the energy of the function f um, in the ball of radius 2b. Then the standard Poincare inequality is bounding the variance of f in terms of r squared. And that sh those should be um, capital R's, not little r's. The, the r's should be the same in these two cases. Now the Poincare inequality gives a lower bound on the spectral gap. And so an upper bound on the relaxation time of the random walk in a ball BXR. On a Sierpinski gasket, it's easy or fairly easy to deduce from the transition density bounds that the relaxation of time in a ball BXR is of order R to the DW, where DW is log five over log two and is therefore bigger than two. And so it's natural to consider the Poincare inequality with a index beta, and we'll denote this by pi beta, which is the same inequality, but with the r squared here now replaced by an r to the beta. So it turns out that we do have that the hk alpha beta bounds imply v alpha and the Poincare inequality with index beta. So we could hope that we can just replace the two by a beta in theorem D and have the other inequality implication here. In other words, that V alpha plus PI beta implies HK alpha beta. But unfortunately, that's not true. And here is one counterexample. Let's look at the product of two spaces with different DWs. So we're going to look at the product of Z and the graphical Sierpinski gasket. So I've tried to denote that in the picture here. Really, there ought to be copies of the graph graphical Sierpinski gasket all the way along. Um, these are the sort of Z lines and this is the gas Sierpinski gasket line. But I thought that if I actually drew them all in, the resulting picture would be um, a mess and impossible to see what's going on. But anyway, I think, hope you can see the basic idea here. We take this graph product. And because it's a graph product, um, basically, um, it's easy to estimate the transition um, uh, probabilities. It's just the product of the transition probabilities of the two um, individual random walks. And in time t, the simple random walk moves the distance t to the 1 half in the z direction but only t to the one over dw, which is a much smaller amount in the sierpinski gasket direction. And what that means is, um, with, it's fairly easy to see that the hk alpha dw estimates fail and the elliptic Harnack inequality fails because if we take a ball in this product, um, the process is almost always going to leave that ball in the kind of z direction having moved only a very small amount in the Sierpinski gasket direction. And so it won't have homogenized or the, the, the exit probabilities will be very different from different points in the ball of X, of, of center X and radius R over two. So the problem we have is that the simple random walk on Z times the graphical Sierpinski gasket 
moves more quickly in some directions than others. And the Poincaré inequality um, prevents the, gives us an estimate on the relaxation time. And it says the relaxation time is no more than r to the dw. So it prevents the process from getting stuck or moving too slowly, but it doesn't stop it from moving too quickly. And so we need another inequality which will stop the simple random walk from moving too quickly so as to rule, rule out um, examples like this product here. And so um, with Rich Bass, we found that in 2004, and we have the following um, emendation of the Delmont theorem and extension to the case beta bigger than two, uh, V alpha plus the Poincare inequality with index beta plus a new inequality CS beta is equivalent to HK alpha beta. So this C stands for cutoff functions and the new inequality CS beta is rather complicated. So I'm going to spare you actually telling you, giving you the exact statement of it. Um, what's good about this inequality is that it's stable under perturbation of weights. And so since all three conditions on the left are stable under perturbation of weights, HK alpha beta is stable under perturbation of weights. What's bad about this inequality is it seems impossible to verify um, uh, directly in any sort of non-trivial um, situation. Let me say a little more about um, cutoff functions um, as that inequality CS relates to the behavior of cutoff function. So we have a graph and we have a function phi from the, the, the vertex set to zero one, and we call it a cutoff function for a pair of balls BXR and BX2R. If the function is one on the inner ball and is zero outside the larger ball. So basically it's a function which takes us down from one to zero over the annulus between the two balls. And the energy of the cutoff function is this quantity here, um, same energies as, as we've seen before. By taking the function linear, it turns out that one can always find a cutoff function with energy less than r to the minus two times the measure of the ball. The CS beta inequality implies that there exist cutoff functions with rather small energy, with energy r to the minus beta. Remember, beta is um, bigger than or equal to two. And it follows that the effective resistance across this annulus here is going to be bigger than a constant times r to the beta times mu, mu, the measure of the ball. And you've actually met this, we've met this before in the second lecture. Um, this is one half of the condition introduced on resistance of annuli, um, the condition introduced by Gregorian and Telch. So, sorry. Um, so here's a conjecture. If you've got local regularity, then the volume bound, the Poincaré inequality, and the annulus resistance bound are going to be equivalent to the HK alpha beta bound. And when alpha is smaller than beta, this follows from a paper of myself, Kulam and Kulam Magai, of 2005. And recently, it's been proved by Mafav Maragon that it holds when alpha is less than one plus beta. So we saw um, previously this picture of the alpha beta um, spaces that are possible. The light blue region is the area where we have strong recurrence and the, the conjecture was proved perhaps before the conjecture was made by um, in the 2005 paper. The dark blue region is the region which Mar Marigan's theorem um, uh, holds for and the um, sort of reddish region down here is, so dark blue and reddish are transient graphs the reddish region here is the region which um, we don't yet have the proof of the conjecture for. And the spaces ZD are marked here with these little squares. So now I want, to, so this is the situation for deterministic random graphs. 
we now would like to do the same thing in higher dimensions that we did in low dimensions and look at random higher dimensional graphs. And Morrigan's result tells us that to prove in, in the case where, where his result um, holds, in other words, alpha less than beta plus one, it's enough to prove volume bounds, a Poincare inequality, and an annulus resistance bound. Um, we saw earlier in this lecture that to handle random graphs such as percolation, one needed to weaken the hypotheses from all balls to all sufficiently large balls. And this has not yet been done in the higher dimensional context. So Maragon's result holds if one has these estimates for all balls, um, a natural challenge is to ask, um, what do we do if we only have this, um, these estimates for sufficiently big balls with appropriate um, definition of sufficiently big. A second challenge is that while the variational principles give a tool for estimating resistance, um, resistance can be quite hard to um, uh, obtain. And in fact, um, most of the successes um, described in lecture two, perhaps I should say all the successes described in lecture two were either trees or graphs um, uh, very close to trees. So when the graph is really not tree-like, um, getting at resistance estimates is still, um, well, can, can be a, a quite challenging. So now I want to talk about, okay, so if we go back to the picture here, um, I'm going to talk about basically graphs for which, um, uh, uh, which lie on the line here between um, recurrent and, and transient. And this is a area of very active research in the last couple of decades. And this is the uniform infinite planar triangulation. So the motivation from this model comes from um, physics, uh, what they call two-dimensional quantum gravity. Uh, physicists are much better than mathematicians at finding exciting um, terms for their, exciting, important sounding names for their models. And this concept was used by Duplantier in 1998 to calculate in a non-rigorous fashion the dimension of the boundary of Brownian motion in R2. And then um, a rigorous proof was of course obtained a year later by Lola Schramm and Werner using SLE. And there is a sort of various connections between these models and SLE, which I won't be discussing at all. So here is the model for the UIPT. Let's look at all triangulations of the two sphere um, or the plane with n faces. We choose one of those, obviously, to, um, we look at an equivalence class of translation of triangulations where the, you know, we sort of look at the topological structure and not the particular location of the point. So there are only finitely many of them. We choose one at random and we denote it un and we choose a random root rho n of this um, triangulation un. And Angel and Schramm in 2003 proved that the distributional limit of the un rho n exists. And the idea of the distributional limit of an increasing collection of graphs is that if you look at neighborhoods of size r of rho n, these converge in distribution to um, bu rho r for all r. So you, distribution of the limit is you look, you set at a point, the random root, your neighborhood in, in the, as converges to the um, neighborhood in the limit um, uh, as n goes to infinity. And, that, and the limiting graph u rho is an infinite connected random planar graph, which is called the UIPT. You can also look at uniform infinite planar quadrangulations and a bijection between these and what's called the integrated Brownian super excursion suggested that UN has diameter in its graph metric of about n to the minus one quarter, sorry, n to the one quarter. And so that the boundary, so that the volume of balls of radius R in this random graph in the UIP T should grow like R to the fourth. It's expected that the 
quadrangulations and triangulations are going to have the same large scale structure. Well, this result was proved by Angel. Um, and obviously not using this because this works with quadrangulations, but anyway, Angel showed that the, in our terminology, the fractal dimension of U is four. And this is a picture of, due to Nicholas Kirian, thanks for allowing me to use it, of a triangulation UN. Um, you might imagine that UN is sort of, if we think about random triangulations, you might imagine that you take a Poisson point process on the sphere and look at the Delaunay triangulation of that. That's not at all what these random triangulations actually are like. Um, you'll see that they have sort of very dense regions and rather sparse regions, and you actually get sort of bottlenecks and, and holes like this. So there's a huge number of triangles here, but if you walk around the edge of this region here, you can cover it in a, in a relatively small number of steps. So these triangulations are not at all what one might originally guess they look like. And um, well, as you can see, they've got rather interesting um, form. Here's another picture, um, uh, also due to Nikola Kirian, of what the UIPT might look like. And again, we see there are sort of sensible parts of the thing as we would sort of expect, but then there are also these areas here of very dense um, uh, little triangulations. So let's look at properties of the UIPT. After Angel's result showing that you have volume growth of R to the fourth. So basically what that means is that if we look at a start at a point here, the presence of these little sort of these very busy regions here means that you've got um, the volume growth is growing much more expect rapidly than one would expect just from the fact that one's looking at a planar graph. So the first question, is it transient or recurrent? A paper of Benjamini and Schramm showed that the distributional limits of planar graphs of bounded degree are recurrent, but the UIPT does not have bounded vertex degree. Nevertheless, it was still conjectured that it's recurrent. So simple approach is to proving recurrence by bounding the effective resistance from the root to infinity don't work. Um, for Z2, a very easy estimate is if we just wire the boundary of balls of radius N, we get the following, that the wiring process reduces resistance and we get a lower bound of the effective resistance from zero to infinity of this type. If one does the same thing for the UIPT, well, the boundaries of balls are actually of size about n squared. So if we do the wiring, we get this bound, which is first of all useless because it tells us the effective resistance is bigger than some um, finite number C. And it's also misleading because it's suggesting that perhaps the effective resistance should be finite. So, Uma, uh, sorry, uh, Uri Gurgurevich and Asaf Nakhmias in 2013 proved that the UIPT is recurrent. And I'm going to be in my final minute or two, have to go a little faster here. Um, some key ideas in their proof. They used circle packings to obtain a quantitative version of the Benny Schramm theorem. The interesting thing is that we start off with graph, natural graph, but actually it turns out to be a graph in a new metric. Um, in this case, they use the circle packing metric and it's got better properties in some ways than the original graph metric. And in particular, they were able to get estimates on the resistance across annuli in this new metric. And then they were able to do surgery on the UIPT um, to remove vertices of high degree and hence reduced to the case of bounded vert degree graphs and then apply the um, uh, Benjamini-Schramm theorem. Now, since we know that now know that U is recurrent, um, but we don't believe it's strongly recurrent, this theorem suggests that the walk of U should be equal to the fractal dimension, which we already know is four. Benjamini and Kirian in 2003 showed the walk dimension is bigger than or equal to three. 
And let's just recall the for, for the relation that holds for sufficiently regular graphs that the spectral dimension is 2df over dw, which suggests that the spectral dimension of u should be 2. So Lee, then we have a succession of theorems in the last few years by Lee, Gwyn, Miller, and Hutchcroft, which show that indeed one has that the ds for the uipt is 2 and dw of u is 4. And main tools here are general properties of random planar maps, a technique used for studying random planar maps and an SLE is mated continuum random trees. One gets a new metric on U associated with mated CRT, which has some of the similar good properties that the circle packing um, metric also has, and then looks at resistance estimates in this new metric. So I'm going to conclude these lectures by mentioning a few open questions very quickly. We already saw that we don't know what the spectral dimension is for critical percolation in two dimensions. If we look at transient random fractal graphs, we really don't know very much. We don't have good methods to handle such graphs as I saw, but also actually <clears throat> so far, we don't seem to have encountered very many natural or any really natural challenging examples of such graphs. The graphs arising from critical percolation and similar models seem to have spectral dimensions smaller than two. And the planar graphs like the UAPT arising from quantum gravity seem to have ds equals two. And a final question is what kind of fluctuations do we see, expect to see in the heat kernel for a random fractal graph? We saw the nice results, um, the pretty um, sort of solid results that we get for the percolation cluster. In a fractal case, we'd expect perhaps more fluctuations but it's not yet clear um, what we get. And I think that's it, so thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for the amazing lecture. Uh, so uh, questions, comments, please either type on the chat box or raise your hand. If there are no questions, people can go and start watching the opening <laughs> of the Olympics. Of the Olympic. <laughs> okay, or the closing right. ceremony of the IMS. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's that's more important. important. <laughs> 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 I have one uh, uh, question. So, yeah. uh, okay, now, uh, Randa Mok on UIPT, uh, there are various uh, beautiful results. So, yeah. is it now possible to get the uh, Sub Gaussian type heat kernel estimates on the random mode. I, I guess we are close to, but I is think, there any well, result? I, I, I haven't been following all the progress. I mean, my impression uh -huh. is that we're still a bit, uh, still a little bit away. So the uh -huh. the various, I mean, I my impression is that we're we are. Um, we're still some way um, away from it. I mean, as you know, even for the best graph in the low dimensional case, that is the uniform spanning tree, mm -hmm. we still have um, various log type um, terms in the sub Gaussian estimate. Yes, yes. And that's, yeah. that's almost certainly going to be true in the UIPT also. But right. because, you know, be because one is looking at a harder object, the log type errors that one gets in the various resistance and perhaps volume estimates are going to be mm -hmm. harder to control. One doesn't have anything like the elliptic Harnack inequality or anything even close to the elliptic Harnack inequality as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's still going to, I think we're still some way off from getting such estimates, mm -hmm. but of course I may be pleasantly surprised. Okay, thank you. So there's one, uh, Andes Schrocker is waiting. Yes. Can you can you hear? Uh, yes. Can you yes. Can talk? Okay. Yes. yes, please. Yes. Thank you. Basically, one question. Um, in your, uh, in particular, in your last lecture, you mentioned relationship to SLE and similar problems. I'm just questioning uh, what would be the role of complex analysis, in particular, several complex variables? Is there any role in the future analysis of the fractal random graph problems? And could this open up any additional perspectives, in, in particular, in higher dimensions that you are talking about today and uh, for the future perspectives? Thanks. Well, I am not really 
very familiar with um, higher dimensional complex analysis. Um, uh, I mean, <clears throat> although, I mean, what's been interesting, I mean, in, in some sense, what one could say is that the work recently on the UIPT has been sort of moving away from complex analysis rather than towards complex analysis. We People started with SLE, but then they've been looking at things like mated CR um, continuum random trees and so forth. Sure. So looking at different ways of handling these, these objects which don't involve um, quite so much complex analysis. So, but basically the answer is, um, I don't know, and anything is possible. Um, so it might make a contribution, but um, I just don't know. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Any more questions, comments? Okay, so if not, let's thank Martin for the beautiful three lectures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. So, so the session will be closed and uh, so please go to the <laughs> closing ceremony and the uh, <laughs> Olympic, <and> Olympic game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.